Now I have a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Anwar Kundu, who is a Master of Business Administration in the University of Texas, Austin. Anwar Kundu grew up in Montreal, Texas, the son of a cathedral. He's a early experience with uh, his father business and important in Marcus to him at last interest in trade and after obtaining his master of business administration he really enjoyed the WTO organization in the nice days. Since then he has spoken on trade matters before a very difficult before. He is currently current in business guys. The title from the Hundred presentation uh, is the future textiles, the future of a lifetime and that life of the future. Thank you very much. This one? Um, it's quite an honor to be here in Tampere addressing this audience of the most outstanding textile workers in the world today. I see on all the faces here today a touching childlike eagerness to tackle the biggest textiles questions in the world. How do we at the WTO fit in? What we want to do at the WTO is help you achieve your dollar results. And in just 20 minutes from now, I'm going to show you the WTO's very own solution to two of the very biggest problems in management. One, maintaining rapport with distant workforce, and two, maintaining healthful amounts of leisure. This solution, appropriately enough, is based in textiles. Uh, but how did workers ever get to be a problem? Before unveiling our solution, I'd like to talk a bit about the history of the worker management problem. Uh, we all know about the American Civil War, at least in the US. Uh, it was the bloodiest, least profitable war in the history of our country. A war in which unbelievably huge amounts of money went right down the drain and all for textiles. By the 1860s, the South was utterly flush with cash. It had recently benefited from the cotton gin, an invention that took the seeds out of cotton and the South out of its pre-industrial past. Hundreds of thousands of workers, previously unemployed in their countries of origin, were given useful jobs in textiles. Into this rosy picture of freedom and boon stepped, you guessed it, the North. Now, some Civil War apologists have said that the Civil War, for all its faults, at least had the effect of outlawing an involuntarily imported workforce model of work. Now, this model is, of course, a terrible thing. I, myself, am an abolitionist. But, uh, in fact, there is no doubt that, left to their own devices, markets would have eventually replaced slavery with cleaner sources of labor. To prove my point, please uh, join me on what Albert Einstein used to call a thought experiment. Suppose involuntarily imported labor had never been outlawed, that slaves still existed, and that it were easy to own one. What do you think it would cost today to profitably maintain a slave, say, here in Tampere? Let's see. A finished clothing set costs $50 at the very least. Uh, two meals from McDonald's uh, cost about $10. The cheapest small room probably runs for about $250 a month. To function well, you have to pay for your slave's health care. If its country of origin was polluted, for example, that might run very expensively. And of course, what with child labor laws here in Finland, uh, much of the youth market is simply not available. Now leave the uh, same slave back at home, let's say Gabon. In Gabon, $10 pays for two weeks of food. $250 pays for two years of housing, not a month at best. Uh, $50 pays for a lifetime of budget clothing. And healthcare is, of course, cheaper. On top of it all, youth can be gainfully employed without restriction. The biggest benefit of the remote labor system, though, is to the slave, him or herself. Because in Gabon, there is no need for the slave not to be free. This is primarily because there are no one-time slave transport costs to recoup, and so the potential losses from fleeing are limited to the slave's rudimentary training. So since the slave can be free, he or she suddenly becomes a worker rather than a slave. Also terrific for morale is that slaves, workers, have the luxury of remaining in their native habitat and don't have to relocate to places where they would be subject to such unpleasantries as homesickness and racism. 
I think it's clear from our little thought experiment uh, that if the North and South had simply let the market sort it out without protectionist tariffs, they would have quickly given up slavery for something more efficient anyhow. By forcing the issue, the North not only committed a terrible injustice against the freedom of the South, but also deprived slavery of its natural development into remote labor. Had the leaders of the 1860s United States understood what our leaders understand today, the Civil War would never have happened. In a world where the headquarters of a company might be in New York, Hong Kong, or Espo, Finland, and the workers are in Gabon, Rangu, or Estonia, how does a manager maintain proper rapport with the workers? And how does he or she ensure from a distance that workers perform their work in an ethical fashion? I'm about to show you an actual prototype of the WTO solution to two major management problems of today. Now, we all know that not even the best workplace design can help even the most astute manager keep track of workers. What you need is a solution that enables complete rapport with workers, especially when they're located far away. Mike, would you help me a moment? <laughs> Thank you. This is much better, much more comfortable. <laughs> This is the WTO's answer to two of the major management problems, and we're calling it the management leisure suit. It's uh, the two problems again, how to maintain close rapport with distant workers, and how to remain comfortable and increase leisure activities. How does the uh, management leisure suit work, besides being extremely comfortable, as I can guarantee you? Well, allow me to describe the suit's core features. This, this is the EVA, the Employee Visualization Appendage. It's an instantly deployable, hit-mounted device with totally hands-free operation that allows the manager to see his employees directly right here. Signals communicating the exact amounts and quality of physical work are transmitted not only visually right here, but directly through electric channels implanted directly into the manager. Uh, the workers, for their part, are fitted with corresponding transmitting chips uh, that are, are implanted humanely directly into the shoulder. But the other equally important achievement of the MLS has to do with leisure. In the United States, leisure, another word for freedom really, has uh, been decreasing steadily since the 1970s. The management leisure suit permits the manager to reverse this trend by letting him do his work anywhere while remaining in complete touch with the workers, physically sensing what's going on in the workforce, on the floor, through channels implanted directly into the manager. Again, the manager sees the employees, but also feels what they're feeling and can select where to focus in the workplace environment. So, in conclusion, I'd like to ask, is this a science fiction scenario? <laughs> um, the answer is no. Everything we've seen here, everything we've been talking about, is entirely possible today. We can always look forward on the highways of progress towards ever new horizons with cooperation and mutual delight in the fruits of prosperity. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you very much. trying to do more and more is yeah uh,